Hi guys, welcome to this chat today uh, with Big Data Leaders. Uh, we have uh, Kumar Menon from Equifax. Uh, we're joined by Harinder Singh from Anheuser Busch, Sandeep Chandani from Unravel, uh, previously Intuit, and myself, co-founder and CEO of Unravel Data. Uh, today we've got a very interesting one. Um, first of all, thank you for everybody for joining today's call. Uh, this is, you know, we're all going through very uncertain times to say the least. Um, this pandemic, combined with all the geosocial unrest, is completely unprecedented to say the least. Um, business models and analytics that have developed over the last several years have perhaps been thrown out of the window or need to be reworked uh, for what we call the new normal. Uh, you know, everything from machine learning models to data products need to be taken into consideration. All of these new factors that may be um, needed to get reworked along with all of the data pipelining that needs to be reshaped uh, for adjusting this new normal. Um, we've seen companies take a defensive position for the first couple of weeks uh, when this pandemic hit. Um, and now we're looking at companies taking an offensive position. Um, and that's the discussion today where uh, we're getting real with data. And uh, we're, we're joined with an excellent panel over here to discuss how they're using data within their companies to be able to uncover both risks as well as opportunities. Uh, so I'll hand it over to uh, our guests here. Uh, thank you all for taking time out today. Can we start with your background and your current role? Start with you, Andrew. All right. Hey, guys. This is Harinder Singh. I lead data strategy and architecture at Anheuser Bush in Bev. Uh, for those of you who do not know, uh, we are also known as AB in Bev, which is a global name. Uh, AB in Bev is a $55 billion uh, revenue company with uh, 500 plus brands. Uh, most well known. So hopefully, all of you guys are happy customers of Corona, Budweiser, Stella. Uh, we operate in 126 countries. Uh, personally, I've been in the space of data and cost management for about 20 years. Uh, prior to being there, uh, I was at Walmart, Stanford, you know, and a few other companies. And uh, we're excited to be here and part of the panel. Thank you, Ander. Kumar? Hey guys, uh, it's Kumar Menon. Um, I lead uh, uh, data fabric at Equifax. Uh, this is really our new way of um, building, you know, data capabilities and insights uh, that we deliver to our customers. Um, you know, being at Equifax uh, um, for a couple of years, you know, you know, post the breach situation that I think almost everybody's familiar with. Um, Equifax, if you guys don't know, is one of the rating agencies in the world, and we are. Uh, a very critical part of the the credit, um, you know, uh, life cycle within the economy in almost all the regions that we operate in. So it puts us uh, in an interesting position, you know, during situations such as uh, the time that um, Kunal just mentioned. Um, we've been in the industry for 25 years, you know, doing data work uh, primarily, um, you know, in in two major industries, uh, highly regulated industries, life sciences and pharmaceuticals, and financial services. Um, and that's the experience that I've been able to bring to Equifax to be able to, you know, really rethink how we use data and, and analytics uh, to deliver new value to our customers. Thank you, Kumar. Okay. Um, hey, everyone. We can hear you. Okay. Hey, everyone. Um, excited to be here. So I'm Sandeep Kishunkani. I am the VP of Engineering and the Chief Data Officer at Unravel Data. Um, in terms of my background, you know, my career has basically been a blend of building data products um, as well as running data engineering um, at large scale, most recently at Intuit, right? And in general, my passion basically has been how do you democratize data? How do you make data self-serve? And really sort of the culture of data-driven for enterprises. Now, at, at uh, Intuit, you know, I was, uh, I was responsible for um, data for Intuit QuickBooks, a $3 billion franchise. And continuing that passion at Unravel, at Unravel, you know, sort of really building out what we refer to as the self-serve platform, um, looking at telemetry data, telemetry data combined across resources, clusters, jobs, applications, and really making sense of it, a, a true data product. 
So really excited to be, um, you know, to be talking more about uh, as we go through changing times and how it maps back. Thank you, Sandeep. So we would love to talk data, but before we get in there, uh, and this will actually help us have some context, why don't we go around the room and, you know, understand what are your companies uh, and just businesses in your verticals, uh, what are they doing at this particular time? What is top of mind for your businesses? And we'll start again with her in there. Sure, sure. sure. Um, so, you know, like most businesses, uh, ours have, have also been uh, impacted. Um, and, uh, you know, if you think about it, right, since we're in the beer of uh, business of beer and we own almost 40 percent market share and most of the beer, uh, with the exception of the U.S. and Canada uh, or in Europe, uh, let's say, is sold in bars and restaurants. Right. Uh, it's, it's only the Europe and the U.S. culture where we actually keep beer cold in the fridge. Right. Most of the Asian countries or African countries don't have this culture. So it's almost an outside activity. Uh, you know, and that kind of goes with the vision of our company to bring people together for a better world. Um, so, you know, like everybody else, we have been impacted as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, but what's on top of our mind today as a business is the following. Number one, taking care of our people. That's number one priority for us, right? Uh, as I said earlier, we operate in 126 countries, right? And uh, wherever we operate, we don't just you know, sort of uh, ship our products. We actually brew locally, uh, sell locally. And that means everything from the grain, uh, the farmer, the brewery, everything is local in that country or city, right? Um, so for us, taking care of our people is number one priority, right? Uh, and there are different ways to do that. Uh, for example, in our corporate offices, we did things as simple as sending office chairs to people's house because in a lot of countries you know people just don't have that proper office chair right and you're sitting long hours uh so after taking care of people our second priority is taking care of our customers when i say customers i'm not talking just our consumers i'm talking actually about bars and restaurants or b2b customers right uh they have been significantly impacted because people are not going into uh uh, places so and we have done that uh by you know by using credit by doing advanced purchases by you know coming up with uh, uh, alliances with other companies and creating gift cards where people can buy gift cards and use it later right uh so that's kind of another way and finally uh another thing that on top of mind is taking care of finances right uh we are a big company and uh uh, it's definitely uncertain time and we don't know how long this will last. So we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we are in it for the long run and, uh, you know, taking care of finances is a very good way to do that. We are very fortunate that uh, our leadership in the C level has very strong finance background. Even in technology, people actually come from finance. So that's definitely, um, you know, something that uh, we are doing as, as, as a business for sure. That's fascinating, Harinder. That, that that was the right sequence of things that we expect from a big company. Um, hopefully, once the life sports start again, the sales will start picking back up. Absolutely. Come uh, on, love to hear from you as well. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so, you know, I just want to you know go back uh, you know a little bit before you know the current uh, situation that uh, you know we are all in. You know, we uh, you know Equifax as a company, you know, we had a significant you know unfortunate breach situation, you know, late in 20, um, 2017, uh, post which, you know, we uh, as a company made a serious commitment to really ensure that we uh, look at, you know, everything that we do as a business in terms of, you know, our product strategy, our platform strategy, our security posture, and really transform the company into, into a new way of, uh, you know, uh, really helping our customers and thereby, um, you know, helping the consumers, you know, that, that really benefit, uh, you know, from all the credit, uh, you know, um, or, or bringing them into the credit economy in a big way. So, so we were, we were in the middle of a massive transformation. We are currently going through that. And, you know, we have uh, this new, you know, situation with the pandemic. Um, in a way, uh, the, 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 the pace at which we were executing the transformation has kind of helped us because we were already executing at a, at a serious pace in terms of completing the rebuild of all our, you know, data and application platforms and re, um, I would say refactoring our product portfolio, our, you know, our engagement with our customers, et cetera. So 
this kind of, you know, um, you know, this situation actually, you know, in fact, I, I would say in many ways helped us um, in a way that, you know, the, the credit economy, you know, when you look at, you know, post the pandemic or at, during the pandemic scenario has taken on a life of its own um, in terms of, you know, how banks and other financial institutions are looking at data, um, looking at the impact, you know, of uh, the pandemic on their portfolios, uh, on their customers. And, and us as a company really looking at the, the more macroeconomic impact of, you know, of, of this situation on the consumer, um, you know, uh, population in the regions that we operated. So, you know, for us, this has been um, an interesting situation in terms of really understanding that traditional, um, you know, data indicators or signals don't really um, you know, hold as much value as they would uh, in, in, in normal times, in these unique times. And we're constantly looking at new indicators that would help not only our customers, but eventually the consumer, uh, you know, uh, still you know, their credit, um, you know, as well as you know, acquire yeah. credit or, you know, you know, uh, go through the situation, you know, in a, in a much, in a much better way. So really that, that aspect of work has really picked up in our, in our, in our uh, in our business. Um, in fact, we are seeing an uptick in some areas of um, business where we are actually helping you know, banks and other financial institution reassess their portfolio. Um, so, so it's been a you know, mixed bag, I would say, where we've seen you know, businesses, you know, um, business uptick in certain areas. In certain areas, of course, we're seeing lower volumes. But overall, you know, as a company, you know, we've, we've actually you know, uh, done pretty well through this. And, and I would say as, as a part of um, you know, really uh, executing the transformation, you know, we've actually had to make some interesting choices. We've had to accelerate things. So we're taking a really offensive strategy where we think that you know, the new capabilities that we are building, the faster we deploy, when we come out in the new normal, you know, this will help our businesses in the regions execute better and serve their customers and eventually the consumers better. So that's been our approach to. Uh, I love it. Yeah. We would love to hear some of those uh, changes that you're making in our next round of questions. Sandeep. Totally. So to answer the question about you know, the impact of the pandemic and the socioeconomic situation, right? Um, I'll basically answer it from my own experience, drawing my own experience, as well as you know my discussions talking to a broader set of CDOs as well you know, on this topic. Right? So I think there are three high-level you know, aspects that, that um, are loud and clear. I think first, data is more important um, than ever. Uh, I think it's extremely, you know, during these uncertain times, sort of having that aspect of using data to make decisions, uh, it's extremely clear across pretty much every vertical, right, that, um, that I'm interacting with. So I think that's one aspect. You know, the other aspect here is the need for agility and speed. So essentially what has happened as a result of the pandemic um, is that if you look at the traditional analytical models, the traditional ML models built over years and years of data, right? Now the question is, do they represent the new normal, right? The kind of thing that um, you know, Kumar was bringing up as well as Hinder touch on, right? Which is how do you now make sure that what you're representing in the form of predicted predictive algorithms, right? Um, forecasting, is that even valid? Um, are those assumptions right? So what this is leading to is the need to now build a whole set of, I would say, analytics, ML models, data pipelines very quickly together. Really sort of, um, in some places I've seen, you know, people sort of, finding um, and looking for signals and data which they otherwise wouldn't have. So agility is loud and clear. I think the last piece of the puzzle as a result of this is more empowerment of the end users. Um, end users here would be the data users, the data analysts, the, the data scientists. In fact, um, you know, the term that is becoming, uh, I would say, increasingly popular is that of a data citizen, right? Everyone within the enterprise needs data uh, at this time, right? If I'm a marketer trying to decide a campaign or if I'm in sales trying to decide pricing, uh, so on and so forth, right? Everyone needs data, uh, especially 
you know, how do you react to the competition? How do you react to changing demand? How do you react to, to changing needs? So I would basically say these three aspects, you know, data becoming front and center, agility, as well as, um, you know, the need to make this available to the end users and end users sort of really asking for this are, are becoming very important. Thank you, Salim, that tees it up nicely. Uh, so let's, let's, let's talk some data. Uh, what data projects have you started or accelerated during these times? If you can shed some light on that. And a second question to that is, how do you continue to leverage you know, data as well as innovate at your different companies while you're thinking about cutting costs and extending your resources? Uh, I, I think that is a very, very important question, right? Because uh, uh, it's definitely, the times have definitely changed and everything we do as a company has to change and align with that. Uh, I think, uh, let me start off by saying this. We were already uh, investing quite heavily in digital transformation, in, in making changes uh, to the company that take us to, you know, sort of next level. And again, I'll talk about, you know, not just us as a company, because, you know, when we look, when we say company, really we're companies made of all these different partners that we work with, right? Uh, so the goal, the journey had already started of, uh, taking this, uh, taking a business view end to end, everything from farmers to customers to breweries and corporations and in between, and how do we streamline the process? Due to COVID though, we had we have really expedited the process, right? Um, I think starting a new process would have been difficult because you know planning and strategy takes a while. But the fact that we were already in it, uh, COVID really gave it a big push, right? Uh, so that's the number one thing. The second thing is uh, we had some really big projects, you know, about uh, streamlining our ERP systems. Um, you know, we, AB Bev grew uh, heavily through m and We acquired many companies and partnered with many companies, small and big. Um, and each company was a successful business in its own right, which meant they had their own, you know, data and technology and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, the other thing we did is we are streamlining our ERP systems across the board. Right, uh, that's a big one. Um, definitely the journey to cloud. Uh, some aspects of our organization, right, were already multi-cloud, uh, and you know we can talk about why multi-cloud and so on and so forth. But again, uh, you know, of, of if if you have to be positive or look at the positive side of this crisis, let's just say that you know on the cloud journey as well, it really pushed us hard to you know, go there faster. Uh, same is true for uh, remote work, right? Uh, something that would have taken, you know, three to five years to execute happened overnight, right? Uh, all the bureaucracy, all the funding problems are solved immediately because if our people can't work, if they can't come online, then the rest of the business can't come online either, right? So all of those individual changes combined together really, I believe, uh, sort of, you know, made uh, a big difference, right? Uh, so the question then becomes, well, <laughs> how do we manage the cost, right? Because all of these things that I'm talking about, expediting it, you require budget to go with it. Uh, one of the things we have done is we have reprioritized uh, some of our initiatives, right? Uh, all these things that I talked about earlier have gone from, let's say, priority three to priority one. At the same time, we had some things that we we're working on that you know have been pushed to the back burner, and you know they will take place in due time. Um, let me give you some examples of you know managing our cutting costs, then, right? Um, since I, I run the data platform, and the approach there was scale, 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 right? Because the business is growing, we're bringing all of these different uh, countries and zones online into cloud. Uh, you know, we always wanted to keep an extra buffer because next market is coming online. We still want to grow, but we have gone from looking at scale to focus on how do we optimize it, right? Uh, and more of a real-time inventory of what I need versus having it three months ahead. And the fact, again, that you're in cloud enables you to do that, right? So it's kind of a... Uh, you know, positive thing on both sides. It helps expedite your journey to the cloud, but the fact that you're moving to cloud helps you keep your inventory lean. Uh, 
And then, you know, in terms of uh, just doing some basic sanity checks, right? Uh, are there uh, systems that have that have been around but just not significantly used, or are there softwares that we uh, need less of? Um, or if if there are things, you know, both in terms of you know technology, uh, hardware, software, or applications, if we need more of those because of COVID then can we negotiate better because of scale gain, right? So those are kind of some of the different ways where we have really taken, uh, you know, the opportunity to expedite the journey um, into, into the digital world and the cloud while also leveraging those, uh, you know, those projects, the scale of it to manage your cut of a cost. Got it, Verinder. So maniacal prioritization, number one, uh, which is, of course, changed with, you know, the climate that we're in. And then secondly, just scrutinizing everything, scrutinizing spend, scrutinizing size, scrutinizing projects, um, and making sure that you're you are scaling in an optimized fashion and not scaling out fast uh, for unforeseen uh, loads and quantities. Uh, if I summarize that correctly. You're absolutely right. Let me also add this. I think we were in a unique position to do that because our company follows a ZBB model, zero-based budget, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which essentially means that every year when we start our year, we don't just say, where were we last year and then build upon it. We start right. from scratch every single year. So that exists in the culture. That's already the DNA. Got it. It's just that we have to, you know, something that we would do once or twice a year, we just had to, you know, take the playbooks out and do it again. That's it. Yeah. So it's actually quite easy for us as a company to do that versus, and I can imagine, you know, big companies having a tough time doing that. Very interesting. One last question before we move on to Kumar. Uh, so on the cloud, definitely there are a lot of uh, advantages for the company moving out there as you, as you described there. Agility, getting your projects to launch there faster. What about some of the challenges that cloud presented to you? Uh, I would say, I, I don't say necessarily it's because of cloud, but because anybody going into cloud, I guess, uh, you have to keep in mind two things. One is uh, it's easy, it's a double-edged sword, right? It gives you convenience, move time to market fast, but also you have to be very careful about security. Uh, you know, and what I'm, what I'm uh, all of these cloud vendors, be Google or Amazon or Azure, they spend more in security than any one of the companies can. So the cloud security out of the box is much better compared to a on-prem system. But also you have to be careful about how do you manage it, configure it, and enforce it, and so on and so forth, right? So that's one part of that. The second part to me is the cost. Uh, you know, if you do a true comparison uh, and, and, you know, don't manage our cost uh, properly, then actually cloud cost can be much higher. If you use properly and manage properly, cloud cost is actually you know much better for business. So making sure that just by moving to cloud, a lot of people actually and companies that I talk to, they say, well, we're going to move to cloud to to save cost. Well, moving to cloud is part of that. That's step one. But making sure you manage the cost right and and watch out for it, especially in the very beginning. Uh, and something as simple as you don't need to run everything on cloud if you need it only for eight hours. Turn it off. Pause it. Slow it. Whatever you need. Right? Making sure move to cloud, but also keep an eye on the cost, especially in the beginning, and and you know prioritize the cost uh, equally. So I think those two things, when done co in combination, uh, really kind of take care of the bottleneck issue of moving to cloud. Thank you. Yep, cloud definitely needs guardrails, right there. Thank you so much for that. I think if I can um, add to uh, on this yeah. point here, right? Okay. Just from our own experience moving into cloud, right in my in my past uh, past lives, I think it's cost is one has to create the business to do it, right? Uh, the point you mentioned here in the is that in the cloud, uh, in, not only do we have to do courses, like you know, using one EC2 instance for 10 hours versus 10 instances for one hour, huge, yeah. huge impact, especially in, in Tumblr. So completely uh, resonate with that. Uh, point here in there, and you also mentioned about uh, multi-cloud. I, I think would love to have to learn more. Maybe maybe you can complete the sequence and come back on that. Sure. 
each one of these topics can be an hour long, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, absolutely. So what data projects have you started or accelerated during yeah. these times? And then the second side of that was really like, how do you continue to you know, leverage data and innovate while while managing or cutting costs? Yep. So, you know, for us, uh, you know, since we were already on this, you know, blazing transformation, executing on this blazing transformation, we didn't really have to, you know, start anything specifically new, I would say. We went through some reprioritization of our roadmaps um, as we went through this. And we were already executing at a, at a serious pace. And we we're really looking to complete this global transformation in a two-year time frame. Uh, so, so what we really, you know, focused on, you know, from a, from a, from an acceleration or from a reprioritization perspective, let me put it as reprioritization, was really deploying the capabilities as quickly as possible into a into the global footprint. Um, you know what we very quickly realized once you know the pandemic hit and we started getting, you know, uh, our interactions with customers, to, uh, you know, was really around how does this impact uh, you know our portfolio and most of our customers are big financial institutions, and we 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 quickly realized that you know traditional data points are no longer as predictive, you know, um, for understanding the current scenario, you know, as, as, um, as Sandeep mentioned before, right? So we had to really reevaluate and look at, okay, what, how can we bring our data together um, in, a, in, a, in a much faster way, in a much, uh, uh, much more frequent manner that can help our customers understand portfolio better, right? And, and obviously, you know, how does this impact our traditional predictive models that we deploy, you know, for credit decisioning, you know, fraud, another, you know, area where we saw some significant uh, upticks in certain areas. So how do we help our customers understand, you know, the, the new ways and the new behaviors around fraud, right? So, so all this required, you know, the, the, the capability to be deployed much faster. Uh, you know, our transformation was based on a cloud-first strategy, so we are all on the cloud, 100%. Uh, so really, that helped us accelerate. You know, pushing these capabilities out into the global regions. Um, you know, at a much faster. We completed, you know, the global deployment. Uh, you know, of several of our platforms over the the last uh, you know couple of months or so, which was which is really, um, you know, the acceleration or the reprioritization exercise that we went through. Um, so that's been that's been our our focus around how we switched um, you know the the roadmaps you know to 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 adjust to, you know to the current situation from a from a data projects perspective you know our goal has always been through the transformation to enable faster ingestion of new data into our ecosystem the ability to bring this data together and drive better insights you know for our customers so so the goal has been always you know how can we bring in more data so we are constantly looking for new data sources you know that we can acquire that can add value to the more traditional and the very high fidelity data sources we already have you know when you look at uh, you know our footprint in a particular region we actually have some of the most uh, you know most um, important data you know about a consumer within that you know within that region that we operate in but then you know, when you look at the, you know, and, and, and in a traditional environment, that data is, you know, does very well. It's very unique and it's very, very powerful. But when you look at uh, a scenario like, uh, you know, the pandemic situation that we're in, we have to bring in other sources of data and, you know, figure out, you know, how does, you know, how does the current situation impact, you know, customers um, and thereby, you know, understand their consumers better. So that's been our, our goal, you know, how can we accelerate bringing the new data? So that's really what, our focus has been over the last few weeks is look at opportunities to bring in new data, faster into the ecosystem, and then you know the whole regulatory angle. That, you know we we are a highly regulated industry, so anything that we do is has to be traceable, transparent, auditable, and explainable. Um, so that that you know obviously adds uh, an interesting wrinkle, um, you know, on everything that we do. You know, while we absolutely have uh, you know a, a, a lot of desire and we actually do currently you know do very advanced techniques around analytics we use ml and ai for several things um, but for some of our regulatory um, you know uh, businesses uh, everything has to be explainable so we you know we've accelerated uh, some of our work in the explainable ai space uh, we think that's going to be an interesting you know play in the market we in fact own uh, a patent today in the industry that uh, allows for credit decisioning using 
um, explainable AI capabilities. Uh, so we want to accelerate that because that we think is going to be a big play uh, as, as more and more regulations start governing how we use data and how we have to explain to our customers or the consumers, um, uh, you know, who actually eventually own the data, uh, you know, explainable AI becomes uh, uh, an important play in the, you know, in the marketplace. Yeah, it's great to hear how companies as Equifax are actually playing offense during this time. Uh, it all comes back to, you know, Equifax always being a data-driven organization, right? In fact, the organization's all about data, That's one right. day or two. Um, so taking advantage of that situation, I don't know how much you're allowed to share, but maybe in the next round, we'd love to hear what are some of these signals uh, that weren't considered earlier that are now considered, for example, maybe it's for, you know, credit score or, uh, you know, some some sort of risk scoring, if you may. Yeah. Uh, would you be able to share some of those, Kumar? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Have, that's kind of I, think, I think all the listeners will, will, will enjoy that as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, we have some unique uh, data assets that, you know, not a, uh, not not many many of the credit uh, you know look, uh, rating agencies have or other financial institution data providers you know have today. Um, you know, for example, you know the standard credit exchange is is all banking you know loan data that we get at the consumer level. Um, you know that that every credit rating agency has. But we also have a very highly valuable data asset called um, our the work number, right? Uh, and and basically what that is is really um, information about, you know, people's employment and income, right? Mm. Um, and then we also have a, a utilities exchange where we get uh, um, utility payment, you know, information of consumers. And if you just take those three um, as an example, and we were able to combine that together, right? Um, you know, I can just, you know, talk about certain, some, some insights that are, you know, you don't even have to be a genius to think about, you know, the, the opportunities that you can, you know, Literally unravel <laughs> through this uh, through this uh, you know uh, uh, you know commingling uh, things like uh, if you were to just look at a traditional credit score that is based on you know credit data you know if I take myself as an example um, and if I say you know Kumar Menon worked in uh, in the restaurant business you know has a credit score of eight hundred or plus right um, and uh, in a, in a traditional way of looking at you know credit scoring. I would be still a fairly, you know, uh, worthy customer to lend uh, money to, or, or you know, would be a, would be a uh, would be a safe borrower. But when, if I overlay my employment information and the industry that I'm working in, maybe there is a certain element of risk that now is introduced into the equation because I'm in the restaurant business. Restaurants are obviously not doing well. So what does that, you know, what does that mean, you know, when I look at Kumar Menon as a as, as as a consumer, right? So there are things that you can do. Um, you know, to understand the portfolio um, and, and plan better, right? Um, I'm not saying that all data points are valid, permissible sure. data points for credit decision, but understanding the portfolio helps uh, financial institutions, you know, prepare better, you know, help consumers, work with consumers better to understand forbearance scenarios, help them, you know, work out scenarios where, you know, you don't have to go into default, right? I mean, the goal yeah. of the financial institution is to say yes to more people bring more people into the credit industry, which is what we are trying to, you know, enable more and more, right? As, as Equifax as a credit rating agency, our goal is to help our consumers get access to more credit, right? So how can we help that scenario? By bringing in more data, you know, helping financial institutions become more aware of potential risks or scenarios that, you know, may not be visible in a traditional, uh, yep. you, know, um, you know, paradigm. How do you get you know, um, you know how do you get uh, them to look at that you know maybe there are blind spots that they don't have visibility to so things like that are are are, are you know are, um, are things well, that we've been customers quite a bit. Right. That's very very interesting. Well, thank you so much for sharing, Kumar. Okay. Where are you, Sandeep? Yeah, I can like you know, So now, if I need my credit scores, I'm just uh, you know, I'm just trying to credit score. I can use Kumar's explainable AI to figure out. <laughs> Or is what it is. Um, I, I think just piggybacking and uh, what Harinder and Kumar touched on this, I think one of the key projects for sure has been accelerated movement to the cloud, right? And when you think about moving to the cloud, it's 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 a highly non-trivial uh, process, right? Um, there is, you know, on one side you have your data, 
and you have tons and tons of data sets right uh, that exist um, in fact in the thousands and then on the other side you have these active pipelines that run daily right pipelines for dashboards ml models you know feeding into the product and the question really becomes what is the sequence to move these right um, some pipelines are fairly isolated data sets with um, I would say trivial query or the kind of query constructs being used. On the other side, you may be using some query constructs which are deeply embedded in you know, the on-prem system, uh, highly non-trivial to move, requiring the re rethinking of the schema, rethinking of the partitioning logic, the whole nine yards. So I, I think, uh, especially when it comes to this aspect of moving to the cloud and you know, sort of speaking from experience as well as talking to so many of the um, you know um, companies in a similar position, um, it, it's it's really really huge. It's a huge undertaking. You know, how do you sequence? How do you minimize risk? These are live systems. In fact, the analogy here is that um, how do you change the engine of the plane while the plane is running? Right, uh, the plane is in the air. You don't have the luxury to um, say, okay, these pipelines, these dashboards, or models won't refresh for a week. Uh, the business would be gone in during that week. So I think that's definitely one absolute uh, project. Right? The other dimension also is, um, you know, the, the meaning of data, right? So traditionally, um, I think as data professionals, we've all been in, you know, the number one question is where is the data? How do I get to the data, right? Um, with the silos and so on that have existed and sort of really not, you know, replicas of data sets, which attribute is authentic, which attribute has been refreshed, right? During the pandemic, the question is now slightly changing into not just where is my data, but is this the right data to use, right? Um, so what, what that basically means is that, you know, are these the right signals I should be relying? Because now we are in a new normal, right? And really requiring, I would say, a combination of both the, the understanding of the business and the um, expertise there Combined with, I would say, you know, the traditional aspects of you know data and the data platform really coming together. So there's clearly that I would say um, increasing synergy in several places as people think about okay, how do I rework my models? How do I rethink? Um, you know, so it's a combination of okay, I'm building this out as well as using the right right data. I think the last piece, uh, which kind of uh, is clearly very important as as a project that is uh, visible as well, is how do you shorten you know, the whole process of getting a pipeline or getting an insight developed, right? Mm -hmm. And the moment you think about the shortening process, what basically happens is that you know, we are writing new apps. We are writing apps to do things which you know, haven't been done before, right? No matter which vertical you're in. And what basically happens is that the moment you have these apps coming out at a fast pace, in production, um, a lot of discoveries that happen, right? Um, apps in terms of misusing the data, using, you know, scanning, uh, doing, a, doing a join across a billion row uh, table, um, all these aspects which, you know, can inundate any system, like one bad query. Uh, it's like, you know, drug, uh, basically, uh, you know, the, when you think of a drainage system, right? Uh, one clog can pretty much clog everything and get everything down in terms of missing SLAs and so on. So I think that's the other aspect in terms of increasing awareness of how do we fortify uh, the CI, CD and the process of improving the apps. Um, because, you know, with Trace, you know, it's it's not about slowing down, but let's have the system underlying platform improvement to be able to, to really sort of get this. So I think that's a real key, key project um, you know, or you know, I, I'd say some of the key projects that, at least uh, from my vantage point, I get to see. I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting point you bring up because, uh, you know, when we look at our, you know, data ecosystem, you know, all the way from ingestion of raw data to, you know, you know what we call as purposing the data for a specific set of, you know, products because we are highly regulated. You know, we, we you can only use certain data points for certain, you know, types of, uh, you know, products. Um, especially in the regulatory space, and then really ensuring that you know the models and you know other insights that execute on that that data, you know, uh, 
uh, you know, all stay in sync. How do we monitor that entire ecosystem? How do we ingest data faster? You know, you know, you know, deploy new models, monitor it. You know, understand. You know, if it's it's performing, um, you know, in the right way, that entire ecosystem needs, you know, as a pipeline. Uh, you know, we've actually really we looked at that ecosystem where we want to we want it to be almost like a push button scenario where you know you know analysts can develop models while they're looking at data schemas that are exactly similar to what is running in production so that there's no rewiring of the data that is required and the deployment of the models are seamless um, you know you're not rewriting the models in, in many of the on prem uh, systems you actually end up rewriting the model in a, in a production system because you know, because of performance challenges, etc. So, you know, the CI/CD pipeline concept. We really want to extend it to the analytics space also, where there is a there is a automated mechanism for a data scientist to be able to build and deploy uh, in a way that a traditional you know data engineer would deploy you know some pipeline code. And so, how do we make sure that you know that synergy is available for us to deploy seamlessly? Uh, it's 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 something that we've actually uh, looked at very uh, consciously and are building it into our stack. Um, so it's a it's a very uh, relevant industry problem uh, that we, you know that 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 um, that I think many companies are trying to solve. We'd love to get uh, Harinder's on that as well. Um, so Harinder, you know, again, summarizing what Kumar and Sandeep were saying is, hey, we're we're growing the data project, uh, and you know, somebody at the end of the day needs to make sure it runs properly. So we're looking at operations, uh, and Kumar made the of comparing it with the, the more mature DevOps lifecycle, which we are thinking about as a data ops lifecycle, right? What are some of these uh, challenges and bottlenecks that are that are slowing you guys down? Um, I would like to start off by you know kind of uh, giving our definition of data ops. The reason I want to do that is depending on you know which company or data leader I'm speaking to there seems to be a slight different version of it, right? The, the way we define data ops is basically end-to-end -end management and support of the data platform, the data pipelines, data science models, and essentially the full life cycle of consumption and production of information, right? So to us, that's data ops. Now, when we look at this sort of life cycle, there's the you know the, the basics of the people, process, technology, and data, right? All of that is there. Um, so let me touch upon each one of these, right? On the people side, um, we have great, amazing people. We started building this team about three years ago, right? And so um, a lot of experienced talent with a blend of you know uh, uh, new and upcomers, and we were still in the growth phase of the team. But I think uh, you know the, the current situation has kind of slowed down that process a bit. I would say so we're not really move. We are not able to move as fast as we want to move in hiring, right? So there's a little bit of that. Um, technology, you know, I would say is uh, uh, you know I, I think uh, technology was always there. It's more of our adoption of it, right? Uh, because you know when you have to sort of strike the balance between growth uh, in data projects and, and more need for data, right? Uh, usually you would have people and technology scale with it. But in our case, like I said, the, the, the people team is not able to grow as fast because of the situation. Then we are looking for automation, right? How can we utilize our team better? So we are definitely you know, uh, going gung-ho on, on CICD. Um, it was there in some parts of the platform some it wasn't there we are finding those opportunities right automating the platform applying full ci cd uh, when we talk about cloud uh, there are scenarios where moving to cloud you know you can move in different ways right uh, you can you can move as a as an infrastructure as a platform as, as a full SaaS, right so we always wanted to be uh, you know sort of platform agnostic and a multi-cloud so there are some things we had done uh, where mostly either on the infrastructure side or on the software, uh, you know, SaaS kind of things. Now we are kind of taking the middle ground as well a little bit, and we are taking uh, sort of moving away from infrastructure to more of a platform as a service model, right? So that again, going back to people, we could you know 
uh, save some time there and, and time to market by moving to that model. Um, and uh, you know, on on the process side, right? It's about striking the right balance between governance and time to market. Uh, when you have to move fast, uh, governance always kind of slows down, right? And uh, you know, uh, Kumar has mentioned multiple times his industry is you know very regulated and everything has to be audited, right? Uh, we are not maybe you know even though we're not in the field of finance, the industry itself. Uh, is very regulated, right? And uh, that means you still have to maintain a, a minimum uh, requirement on uh, on you know uh, mix on compliance. There's a lot of depending on which country we are in. In U.S., not so much, but you know, in in other countries where we operate, there's always the GDPR. So all of those things still have to be maintained, right? While we move fast to meet the demands of our internal customers for data and analytics and insights. So I think that's kind of a, and, and you know, when we talk about uh, this whole process end to end, I think to me, it's just about how do we continue to scale and, and meet the needs of our business while also do our best to strike the balance. Um, just because of the, the space we are in and, and, and you know, uh, uh, and when I talk about regulation, I'm not just talking about you know the, the the required regulation or compliance. It's also just good data hygiene, right? Maintaining the catalog, maintaining the glossaries, right? So those things have to be done equally, and they're equally important, not necessarily required. Uh, so right now, it's just that competition of sometimes uh, speed takes over, and sometimes the governance takes over. Just trying to find the right balance there. As is every organization, Hunter. You're not alone there for sure. <laughs> Anything to add there? No, I mean, I, I think you, know, you covered it uh, pretty well. Uh, I mean, I think I think for us, you know, you know, obviously the move to the cloud, you know, you, you you really have to have a different philosophy when you're building cloud native applications versus what you're building on prem, right? So really, how do you you know improve your um, you know the skill sets you know of, of the people? To think more broadly, now you take a developer that has been developing on Java on prem, and you know she or he now has to have an understanding of a little bit about infrastructure, a little bit about the network, a little bit about how cloud security works, so that we can actually, you know, really have security in the stack versus just an overlay on the application. A lot of on-prem applications are built that way; they're relying on perimeter security by the network. How do you actually engineer, you know, your the right IAM policies? Into your, you know, into into every layer of your, you know, of the services you're building, right? How do you make sure that the encryption and decryption capabilities that you enable, you know, through the application, you know, how how do you make sure that you know that is that that is all adhering to a uh, an enterprise wide policy? Um, you know, we come back. I come back very often to you know the ability to deploy into the cloud. How do you ensure that your deployment is compliant, right? How do you make sure that you know everything is scored in the cloud? Infrastructure is scored, security is scored, your application is scored. How do you check in your CI/CD pipeline that you have all your controls in place so that your build fails and you know you don't actually deploy if you if you're violating you know policies? So we've looked at and we've actually started to implement policy as code within our CI/CD pipeline to ensure that no bad behavior you know um, you know really manifests itself um, you know in production. Um, and you know we've, we've ruthlessly looked at security. Um, you know, obviously, you know we, you know, we, you know, because of the situation we were in before, as well as the fact that you know we we hold some very valuable high fidelity data, you know, right. in the regions that we operate in. Uh, how do you ensure that you know what our uh, security posture is on the data as well as on the technology stack that you know uh, that operates on the data? So those have been some very uh, interesting learnings. I would say I wouldn't say this has you know slowed us down, but these are mandatory things that we have to do and learn and be able to master as a company. Uh, so that's been you know as as been our big focus areas as as we are transforming. Regulations, I think, is a, is 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 an ever um, you know um, I would say a changing world. We've, we've encountered new regulations as we are building this. You know, you have new privacy laws that are coming into existence. You know the CCPA, you know, uh, you know, act in California, and I think there will be other states, you know, pursuing similar privacy laws. 
how does that impact you? Uh, obviously, globally, when you extrapolate that, you know, GDPR and other, you know, regional laws. So when you deploy in the cloud, how do you make sure that you still, you know, are adhering to the data residency requirements, uh, you know, within those regions, right? As well as the privacy laws that, you know, that impact you. That you so really, that's that's, um, you know, how do you build a, an architecture that can adapt and be flexible to that change? Is really the is the big the big challenge. So I think you know that's that's my learning through this transformation is how do you make sure that you're always able to adapt fast and is your architecture flexible enough to you know accommodate that. That's right. That's right. Come on, that's a lot to think about. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, Sandeep, any any thoughts there? Um, totally. I, I think that Harinder and Kumar touched on this. I, I, I define data ops as a point where point in the project where the honeymoon phase uh, sort of ends and the ground reality sets in, right? Um, the phase of like, you know, you can prototype and sort of build out the models and analytics. And data ops is where, as Harinder put it, right, the end to end uh, cycle. Right? And so many of these aspects that, that come in. Um, I, have, I have way too many battle scars. Uh, you guys cannot see it because I put on makeup. But uh, you know, just to just to touch on a couple of scars here, like you know, um, over a single weekend, you know, we were uh, I've seen you know uh, a bad query um, accumulate like you know more than hundred thousand dollars in cost, right? Um, so you know, a data scientist trying to do and run something on the side, you know. Um, so that's an example where if you don't really have the right guardrails, just one weekend with GPUs, high-end GPUs in play, uh, trying to do ML training for a model that honestly we did not even require, um, you know, you you get a bill of hundred thousand. So that's that's one example of uh, a possible scar. I think the other thing is um, just the sheer root cause analysis and debugging. Right. Um, what has basically happened is with so many technologies and plethora of technologies out there. Right. On one side, the philosophy of you know use the right tool for the job. Right. Which is actually the right thing. There is no silver bullet. Right. But then the you know if you look at the the other side of it, the ugly side of it, right? What that basically means is that the skill set required to understand, right, how Presto works versus how Hive works versus how Spark works. How do I tune it? How do I really figure out where the issues are happening? Um, it, it's it's much more difficult now, right? How do you how do you package that? So root cause analysis uh, burns several times. You know, pipeline missing SLAs, query not running. Um, figuring it out is one of those uh, one of those issues which is getting, I would say, you know, clearly a bottleneck that has always been there, and now with you know some of the agility aspects um, becomes even more critical. I think the last thing to wrap up, and I think Kumar touched on this, is also a very different way to think about some of the newer technologies. Right, if you think of these serverless technologies like you know Google BigQuery or um, you know, um, AWS uh, Athena, right? Uh, these these have different pricing models, right? Here, you're actually being charged by the amount of data scanned. Um, so, you know, imagine a query that, you know, is basically doing a massive scan of data can incur a significant cost. So again, that whole mindset of um, incorporating that early on says that data ops is seamless. And, you know, I, I really define the exercise of how do you, how do you sleep well and avoid surprises, right? And and all those aspects, be it compliance, um, cost, uh, root cause analysis, tuning, and so on. So, um, great, rich topic. Thank you. We're almost at time here, so we'll have one one minute rapid fire round question from from everybody as a parting thought. You know, there's several hundred people listening in right now. Um, what should all of us data professionals plan for uh, as we're thinking through this prolonged period of uncertain times? What should they do now, that, that one thing that they should be doing right now that they have not done in the past? And we'll start with her in there. All right. Um, I actually have not one, but five, but they're all very quick. Awesome. <laughs> uh, first of all, empathy. Uh, we are in completely different times, make sure you have empathy towards your team, towards your business partners. That's number one. Uh, number two, move fast. You know, it's not the time to think, plan. You just have to move fast and adapt, right? So to me, that's important. Number three, manage your cost. 
uh, again, very interesting times. And I think if, if this takes too long, then the, the company with the strong balance sheets and how to manage costs will be very useful. Uh, number four, focus on your business partners internally. Try to understand what their needs are. Because remember, it's not just you. Everybody in a unique situation. So your business has never faced this challenge before. So focus on your internal customers. What do they need from you in terms of data and analytics? And finally, focus on your external customers, right? Um, try to understand um, you know, their need. Um, one of the most important thing would be maybe changing the delivery model of your product or service and kind of meet where the customer is instead of expecting a customer to come to you. Uh, I think you know, these are not, not, none of these five points is necessarily new. I just wanted to emphasize it because I think there are some things we can't control, but if most businesses do these five things, they will definitely come out stronger at the end of it. Makes absolute sense, right there, Kumar? Yeah, I think I think Haribo covered almost all of it. I just had a couple of. Yeah, Jolin, that's why I said one one point each. <laughs> yeah, I, was just, uh, I, think, I think you know, I, I totally agree with uh, you know focusing on your internal customers. Obviously, focus on the ecosystem you're operating in. So it's your customers as well as potentially your customers' customers, right? So how does the full value chain work? Um, you know, definitely make sure that you connect a lot more with your customers. Uh, you know, your co-workers, uh, you know, these times obviously call for over-communicating. So really, that's really how you keep the momentum going. Um, I think, uh, you know, in, in several scenarios, there are new opportunities that are that are being unearthed in the market space. So really watch out for where those opportunities lie, especially when you're in the data space. You know, there are new signals coming up, there are new ways of looking at data that can provide you better insights. So how do you constantly look at that? Um, and then I think finally, I would say is the regulations, you know, keep an eye out for how fast regulations are changing. I'm pretty sure new regulations will be in play, um, you know, when we hit the new normal. So just make sure that whatever you build today can withstand, you know, uh, you know the, 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 the challenge of you know, the time. Thank you. Sandeep? I think excellent point uh, going last. There's not much left. But <laughs> one one thing to emphasize, uh, you know, one advice to data professionals would be, you know, really also focus on data literacy and you know, um, explainable insights uh, within your organization. Right? Um, not everyone understands data the way you do. Right? And when you think about insights, you know, insight basically is a collection of three part pieces. Right? You know, what's going on, why it is happening, and how do you get out of it? Right? And you know, while not everyone will have the skills and expertise to do all three, the what part, right? right? What's going on in the business? How to think about it? How to slice and dice it? Data professionals have a unique opportunity here to really educate, build that literacy within their enterprises, and um, you know, for better decision making. So, so something that they can really uh, uh, leverage, uh, especially important during these times. And obviously, in addition to everything that Harinder and uh, Kumar mentioned, you know, I, I love those points uh, spot on. Thank you. Guys, again, this is a fantastic one hour. Uh, we had a ton of viewers here today. Uh, I hope we all took away something from just learning within all of us data professionals. I certainly learned a lot. And Harinder, Kumar, Sandeep, thank you so much for taking time out during such a crazy time and sharing your experiences, all the practical advice and strategies uh, with the entire data community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.